Hi, everybody. Welcome to the April 2021 Vamp Storytelling Showcase, Gods and Monsters. We have a host of brand new stories for you tonight. Over the next 90 minutes, we're going to spin together. And we got to film it at the Whistle Stop for the first time in 14 months. Oh my gosh, everything about being in that place felt like coming home again. From the beer that spilled somehow in my hair, to the performers that filled the bathroom with uh, nervous bowel movements right before they hit the stage. Now we aren't able to come back with full live audiences just yet, but we're hoping for some really good news in the next few months. That is, as long as nobody listens to those yoga instructors who think vaccines are bad, but will put anything up their vaginas as long as Gwyneth Paltrow says it's okay. Uh, so until that day comes, we're gonna rent outdoor venues to help get us back together safely again. And for that, we need your help. Starting tonight, So Say We All is launching its spring fundraiser called Homecoming, with a goal of raising $12,000 by Sunday, May 9th. We need to make up a lot of that income we've lost over the last 14 months due to the pandemic from live shows going down. We need to rent those outdoor spaces that Jen just mentioned, which cost us a pretty penny. And we need to invest in the streaming technology to make sure all of our future shows are streamed on the internet to the entire world, servicing both our storytellers and our audience members alike. Please do your part to bring us all back home together by visiting www.sosayweall.wildapricot.org. Make him happy too. Click on donate right now. If Amazon has the audacity to charge $15 for the right to watch the live action movie Cats, you can help out your favorite San Diego storytelling organization reunite its community. And they even edited out the buttholes. Thank you, as always, for helping us make San Diego a city we want to live in, and we cannot wait to get back and see you in person again soon. Fergus Fenton Fenley says hello. As does Moira. Now, please welcome this month's VAMP volunteer producer, the amazing Ben Kent. Un, two, three. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome. So welcome to So So We All's April Vamp Showcase, Gods and Monsters. So my name is Ben, I'm your producer for the night. Uh, this will be my first show producing with So Say We All since I joined last year with the Veterans Writers Workshop. So I'm super excited to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we've got a great lineup for y'all tonight. Uh, you're gonna hear stories from Leslie Ferguson, Rachel Medlock, Isabella Raboni, Patrick Mayuyu, Karen Malfara, Anna Zapeta, and virtually Alexandra Rostova. So, yeah, just give him a hand. And up front, a big thank you to the Whistle Stop Bar for having us again tonight uh, after a year of remote vamp shows. So, we're happy to be back in yeah. person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so with that, without further ado, our first storyteller of the night, Leslie. Mom is alone, with voices raging in her head, and a gun sitting in her lap. She holds it like a baby, her pale wrists shiny in the flickering light, and the revolver glimmering like black licorice. Her eyes shift from mirror to mirror to mirror to the road, where truck headlights blind her. She thinks the communists are coming to get her. The glossy windshield turns taillights into blurred halos. Then an explosion cracks and the car careens into the concrete median like a pinball in a machine. Mom's head hits the steering wheel with the force of an arrow shot from an automatic bow. Her knees slam into the base of the steering column and scrapes, gashes, and bruises paint a dark sunset over her skin. The gun fires into her gut opening a bloody wound. The car is totaled, and she blacks out. That's what I imagine it must have been like for mom the night she crashed. But I'll never know. Grandma answered the phone, and someone on the other end said something that made her voice shake. I tugged on her homemade blouse, the one with the top hats pattern that made me think a hundred fancy men had lost their hats and grandma's blouse had found them. 
<laughs> Your mother's been in an accident, she said, and hugged my brother William and me at the same time. We asked if mom was okay, and grandma said yes, but refused to share details. She was the keeper of hats and secrets. Then I overheard her telling grandpa mom had shot herself. Two months later, on a humid summer day, we visited mom in the hospital. The building was just a building, but it held mom behind its window eyes and glass door mouth. In the parking lot, I pulled back, slipped my hand from grandpa's. I didn't want to go in. William followed Grandma. He always followed so easily. I always fought. Even when I tried to be good, I couldn't help being difficult. Grandpa said, come on now, and kept his arm out toward me. And I was supposed to take it, as if I didn't hate Mom for being sick and for getting into a car accident and ending up in this place. As if I didn't hate my grandparents for dragging me to see her. My constant reminder of fear and unpredictability. I wanted to avoid her and love her at the same time, but nothing I wanted was possible. The slow rise in the elevator made my stomach drop. When the doors opened, Grandma gently pushed me out. Patients in hospital gowns groaned and moaned like animals. The odor of wet cardboard and urine laced the air. Everyone was free to roam like it was one big human zoo. I looked for mom, but I hoped I wouldn't see her. I didn't know what to say. Grandpa had kicked her out months before the accident. Now, she was more like a stranger than a mother. Something was wrong with her. I just didn't fully understand what. Still, I knew she wasn't a drooling, moaning, brainless lunatic. Did she belong here with these people? She'd only crashed her car and shot herself. Then again, when she was with William and me, mom had done many dangerous things. Maybe I wasn't the best judge of where she belonged. I was going to throw up. I clutched my stomach. My body was trying to prove to me the truth about fear and how it makes me hungry and sick at the same time, makes me wish I was anywhere else but here. My nose was good at remembering the things I tried to forget. There she was, standing at the far end of the wing. And even though she wasn't bleeding this time, the tinny smell of blood filled my nose. My insides burned. Was I on fire? I could go up in flames and nobody would notice until it was too late. A wide-eyed man stumbled toward me licking his lips over and over again as if I were a delicious treat for him to devour. Another man barked at the wall, and a human kitty meow answered him from somewhere in the distance. Mom smiled at me from the doorway of a room, a hospital gown hanging to her knees over a pair of sweatpants. She squinted. Her eyes were smaller than I'd remembered. Hi, my babies, she said. I love, love, love you so much. She held her arms out toward us like a monster. I love you too, I said, but the word love felt fake on my tongue, empty and sour, hollow, like we'd only just created it. I love you too, someone said. It sounded full and real. William. It was the first noise he'd made since we exited the car. I'd almost forgotten about him. Mommy wishes she could be with you all the time. She hugged William and me again. But they won't let me leave. And they electroshocked me. As I pulled away from her, she put her hands on her temples. It was awful. Come here. She moved to the bed and patted the spot next to her. William snuggled into the space under her arm. If she wanted to be with us so badly, why did she keep doing things to separate us? She missed William's seventh birthday because she tried to kill herself that one night with a knife. And now, she was probably going to miss me turning nine. Mom leaned back against the pillow. Thanks for bringing them, she said without looking up at Grandma and Grandpa. And about the accident, she looked at me and then at William. I wasn't even going that fast. 
Grandpa said Mom's name, and Grandma shook her head, which meant they didn't want her to talk about the bad stuff. They are my children, Mom said. Grandma said, I know. Mistakes, pain, and truth lay under Grandma's tongue, or maybe even deep in her throat. She ignored the subject and sent it away with a heavy sigh, like she always did. Mom hugged us again. Then she placed my hand under her gown, along her rib cage, to the exact spot a bullet had ripped a hole in her side. It stretched on like a thin, already calloused rope built into her skin. Mom guided my fingers back and forth over the crusty scab, as if she intended to teach me about the nature of woundedness. Touching her scar like that made me think of Aladdin's lamp and how, when you rub it, a genie slips out in a puff of smoke to grant wishes. I pulled away, but she wouldn't let go of me. She wanted more. She always wanted more. She squeezed my hand, and my knuckles shifted under the weight of her grasp. It's healing fast, she said. I'm not even sure what happened exactly. I didn't mean to pull the trigger. Her jaw shook, and she reached up to steady it. It's the medication. It does this to me, and I can't have my cigarettes here. It's driving me crazy. You weren't on your medication when you crashed, Grandpa said, still in the doorway, like he expected the frame would protect him if the building crumbled. You've got to take it, Roberta. He shook his head once and ticked his tongue. The gun wasn't even mine, Mom said. You have to believe me. Roberta now, Grandpa said. Let's not discuss it in front of the kids. They've been through enough. My grandparents thought they were shielding us from harm. They didn't know half of what William and I had experienced when we were alone with Mom. We had secrets, too, and we had protected them from the truth. I just want you to know, Mom said, I was holding it for a friend, keeping it safe so it wouldn't get stolen in that place I was staying in. Grandpa said Mom's name again. Mom readjusted her position on the bed, as if getting comfortable with the idea of shutting up. She used her arms to boost herself, grimacing. It was possible she'd stolen the gun. With Mom, truth and lies ran together in the same pack, often blending into each other to create a single mixed-blooded beast. If I was supposed to believe her about the gun, wasn't I also supposed to believe the other story she told? Like how we were better off dead than captured by spies and hung by our feet like bats in a dungeon awaiting our torture? None of those things had happened, so maybe the gun story wasn't real either. Was I supposed to believe her when she said she loved me? Grandpa said it was time to leave, and Grandma stepped toward the door. But you only just got here. Mom said. Grandma turned toward her and said, it's been a good visit. Her cheeks were wet. We'll call. Please come back soon. Mom made William and me promise not to forget her. She hugged us and wiped her eyes. The oxygen had been sucked out of the hallway. Or maybe I'd forgotten how to exist. Once in the elevator, I faced the doors, and as they closed, Mom stood outside her room, watching us and waving. I was so mad at her, but I still needed her to love me. I waved, but the lip-licking man blocked my view of her. The elevator shook on its descent, reminding me of Mom's shakiness. How could I forget her? She was everywhere. I didn't know the difference between how I felt and how I should have felt. Maybe without Mom, William and I could be normal. With her, the only things that seemed possible were fear and my need to make her keep loving me. Maybe I didn't even love her anymore. I didn't know. At least if she was in the hospital, I wouldn't have to worry she might kidnap us. I wouldn't have to fight so hard to stay alive. But was I betraying her by wanting her to stay locked up while I was free? My stomach growled. I imagined it was a machine grinding its gears and eating itself. I thought about the scar on Mom's magic lamp belly. I'd rubbed it enough to bring a genie. 
but a genie never came. When I was 24 and preparing to become a Buddhist nun, my mentor encouraged me to spend a full year practicing my ordination vows. Every day I kneeled in front of the small shrine inside my bedroom at the Buddhist center and recited those vows, preparing to live a life of meditation, contemplation, service, and celibacy. While my mentor prepared me to change how I viewed myself, he didn't prepare me for how others would view me once I put on the gold and burgundy robes of a nun. The change was immediate. Overnight, people stopped seeing the me behind the robes and began to see only the robes themselves. Complete strangers started pressing their hands together at their hearts, bowing and giving me knowing smiles in places as ordinary as the grocery store. Or people I'd known for an hour would tell me of their most challenging experiences, like the death of a child, and wait for comforting advice. Robes created an erasure of self. They became a buffer between me and the world, a bell jar that sometimes felt like protection, sometimes a trap. In the final few years of my 13-year ordination, the people surrounding me most often were my students. They assumed that I had all the answers, or at least more than they had. I grew accustomed to playing the role they projected upon me that of the great and powerful Oz. The much smaller, human-sized person stayed hidden behind the robes, and like Oz, I hoped that others would pay no attention to the woman behind the curtain. To ordain is to conform, to fit within a box. Any part that does not fit in the box must be amputated. Fitting comfortably within the box of ordination is easier for some than it is for others. For me, the pieces that fit included my natural tendency towards introspection and my only child's ability to be happily alone for long periods of time. The celibacy part didn't seem so bad either because as a masculine of center gay woman, I carried an underlying belief that I would never be attractive or lovable anyway. But there was plenty of me that didn't fit inside the ordination box, and these parts had to go, or at least stay hidden. This included my love of art and literature, my sci-fi fantasy nerdiness, and yes, my membership card to the queer community and all my attendant queer desires. Ordained people become asexual over time, a monk friend told me. I smiled and nodded, but I disagreed. Wearing robes never made me any less gay, and regardless of what he claimed, I seriously doubt his robes made him any less straight. What did change, though, was that behind the curtain of my robes, my queerness became invisible. For the first time in my life, I could pass as straight. Strangers addressed me as ma'am instead of sir. I expected to enjoy this particular invisibility, this privilege of finally being recognized as a woman, but I didn't. Ordination for a gay person means more than sexual abstinence. It means amputating an entire community, an entire identity. Yet letting go of old identities to embrace the new is what ordination is all about. I was supposed to relish that shedding of the old self, the way a butterfly might relish leaving the caterpillar behind. 
Instead, I mourn the selves I lost, the queer self, creative self, nerd self. I wasn't supposed to be mourning, so I hid my grief within the folds of my robes, even from myself. But sometimes a screw is installed crooked, but it will still hold. It can hold for years, but gradually the threads wear away. And one day, much to everyone's surprise, whatever the screw was holding together falls apart all at once. The first sign of trouble came in 2014. I was 35, and I'd fit myself inside the box of ordination for a decade. But one of my amputated selves, the nerdy creative one, regenerated in the stolen moments between meditating, counseling students, and teaching classes, I quietly began writing young adult urban fantasy novels. I told myself writing fiction was a creative outlet, a way to supplement my limited income, but I knew writing would be corrosive to my ordination. Writing threw back the curtain, allowing sunlight into a room that had been closed off for too long. Writing meant breathing again, but I hadn't even been aware that I'd been holding my breath. I suppose it was inevitable that I progressed from writing YA novels to lesbian fiction. At first, it seemed that writing stories about queer women would be healthy, a way to express those amputated desires without actually acting on them. Even so, I wrestled with whether or not to finish To Have Loved and Lost, the first of several lesbian romance novels I would write. I could sense the way the writing it tugged at the loose threads of my already unraveling Buddhist robes. Throwing back the curtain to allow in some light was one thing. Writing To Have Loved and Lost felt more like tearing the curtain down altogether. In the end, I finished it anyway. Then I watched with utter shock as it shot to the number one spot in Amazon's lesbian romance category and stayed there for over a month. 3,000 miles away in San Diego, a lonely gay woman trapped in an unhappy straight marriage read my book over the course of a vacation she almost didn't send me the Facebook message telling me how much she'd enjoyed it and asking if I'd look at a short story she'd been working on. She could sense the way the writing of that message tugged at the loose threads of her already unraveling marriage. But in the end, she sent it anyway. By the time I got Lizzie's message, it was 2017 and I was the resident teacher at the Buddhist Center in Washington, DC. I taught classes on Buddhism and meditation all over the DC area each day. Each night, I hung my robes in the closet and soothed myself with Netflix and novel writing. I justified these minor sins as stress relief rather than admitting what they really were symptoms of 12 long years pretending to be someone I was not. But within a few months of receiving Lizzie's message, I committed the one sin a celibate Buddhist nun cannot come back from. I fell in love. At first, Lizzie and I talked mostly about writing, her writing and mine. But soon we progressed to long daily emails about our oddly parallel lives. Emails became texts. Texts became phone calls. I recognized what was happening, but there is no stopping it. I kneeled before my shrine and prayed more fervently than I ever had, except I no longer knew what to pray for. The spring after I met Lizzie, I made my annual pilgrimage to the Buddhist temple in upstate New York for what would be the last time. I greeted friends I only saw at these annual gatherings with hugs and standard Buddhist small talk like, 
How are the things at the temple in Seattle? I kept my robes pulled tight around me, hoping no one would see the tumor of love growing inside me. I smiled. I talked about Buddha's teachings. I played Oz for my students. But inside, I was playing the role of a very different character, the protagonist of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. My heart, my literal heart, was imploding inside my chest. I didn't know what a panic attack was. I'd never had one before. So when a two-ton pile of bricks landed on my chest and made it hard to breathe, I thought maybe I was about to have a heart attack. At night, in a dorm room filled with nuns from around the country, I laid awake in the dark, one hand on my chest, willing my heart to continue beating through the night. The worst of it came a few days later when I joined my mentor and some old friends for dinner. I wasn't consciously thinking of my secret sin in San Diego or of the fact that my ordination was unraveling, but my heart was. The pain in my chest became so unrelenting that I began to worry I might collapse in the middle of dinner. At last, I told my friends so that in case I really did collapse, they would know what to describe to the EMT who came to revive me. One friend, someone acquainted with panic attacks, gave me a long, searching look and finally said, I think you're all right. I think it's stress. Everyone knew we were negotiating a multi-million dollar deal to buy a church in DC. They nodded knowingly. Just stress, they agreed. I was both reassured and horrified. Reassured I was not having a heart attack, horrified by the real cause of my stress, deceiving a table filled with my dearest friends. I disrobed three months after that dinner, sending shock waves through my Buddhist community. I resigned my position in DC and moved into my parents' spare bedroom in Atlanta. A butterfly isn't supposed to become a caterpillar again, but in the cocoon of that spare bedroom, I grew my hair out and bought ordinary clothes for the first time in years taking my gold and burgundy robes off their hangers and replacing them with shirts and jeans. Meticulously, I folded the robes and placed them in a box addressed to the temple in New York. A monk or nun, maybe even one of my friends, would put them to better use than I could. Maybe my robes would fit them better than they'd fit me. I placed a note on top that said simply, I'm sorry. I didn't sign it. They would know who sent them. And besides, I was between names. I could no longer call myself Gen Kelseng Nyema, Gen for teacher, Kelseng for the family of monks and nuns I belong to, Nyema as my individual ordination name. Yet it seemed wrong to sign my name as Rachel. It was a name I barely inhabited, a name that had been amputated years earlier. I've worn many names in the years since I mailed Gin Kelsang Yema back to the temple. Names like girlfriend, author, personal trainer, graduate student, middle school teacher, coach. All the names fit. None of the names fit. I tug at them self-consciously, like robes askew. Part of myself was mailed to the temple in that cardboard box. And much to my own surprise, I mourn the loss of that self. Like a phantom limb, my ordained life still haunts my sleep. Three to four nights per week, every week since I disrobed. I dream of myself in Buddhist robes. 
Perhaps a day will come when the dreams will stop and no version of myself will feel like a fraud. After all, even the great and powerful Oz got to go home once he confessed he was only human. When I was little, I started comparing myself to the other girls I was friends with. For some reason, my belly would protrude more than theirs. Everyone else had flat stomachs, the girls on TV, the girls on magazines, and all my friends, but I didn't. I had one other person in my life whose belly resembled mine, and that was my mom. My mom didn't like her belly, though. She would often complain about how she'd lost her flat stomach and now it stuck out. She would look at herself in the mirror with this cloud of gloom looming over her, wishing it was as small as it used to be. If my mother hated her stomach and it looked just like mine, then I should hate mine too, right? But I was so little, I didn't know what there was to do about it. This is just the way I am. I'm abnormal and weird looking but there isn't anything I can do, I thought. So I tried to suck it in so people wouldn't notice, hold my arms over it to hide it, and never slouch so nobody would see my rolls. I carried on with this routine for years, and as I got older, I added to it to try and keep my protruding belly a secret. Oversized clothes helped, and so did eating and drinking less. I noticed when I ate too much or drank too much water, my belly would get bigger, so the solution was simple eat and drink less. When I entered my teenage years, I was introduced to social media and everything it had to offer. It was a wonderful place that taught me the art of dieting. <laughs> dieting, you can still eat what you want, you just have to count your calories. <laughs> I'd never thought about calories before, but after my recent discovery, they began to consume me. I would look at the calories on everything. My new goal was to eat as few calories as possible. I could finally be thin like the other girls. And I kept this up for a while. I convinced my family to let me go vegan because vegan food was less fattening. <laughs> I lived off of my 45 calorie rice cakes with a 90 calorie tablespoon of vegan peanut butter and of course a Diet Coke. <laughs> but this wasn't sustainable. My body was malnourished and craving the nutrients I refused to give it. I began to crave food uncontrollably to a point where the need for food clouded everything, and I started abandoning my diet for just a small taste of my grandma's lasagna. But that small taste was so good. What's one more bite? And then another, and another. Oh well, I thought, I'll start my diet again right after this. But this became a cycle, and every time food was offered to me, I absolutely couldn't refuse. I would tell myself I'd start my diet again right after. I never could. After denying my body for so long, I began binge eating. I was so ashamed, I would hide food in my pockets and sleeves and eat in secret in my bedroom or the bathroom. But this wasn't sustainable either. I felt so sick all the time from the abundance of food and I'd begun gaining weight again. I was so disgusted with myself, I started researching online looking for any source of hope. I was ready to do anything in order to end this terrible cycle and lose this weight. That's when I discovered Pro-Anna. Pro-Anna stands for pro-anorexia, and there were hundreds of blogs and websites dedicated to it. I knew of the dangers of anorexia, hair loss, heart damage, osteoporosis, infertility, many more. Among the many dangers anorexia threatened, I never imagined I'd face those consequences. Pro-Anna was my saving grace. Everything I could have hoped for. It offered promises of fast weight loss, inspirational quotes, tips and tricks, and inspiration. The best trick I learned? Throw up. It was wonderful, exactly what I needed. I could eat whatever I wanted and just make myself throw up afterwards. 
There were lots of tips on how to do so, and I was determined to master it. I started trying it every time I ate, but it proved difficult. And then I learned that if you can't throw up with your fingers, use a toothbrush. And voila, perfect. I started sticking a toothbrush down my throat every time I ate and would purge all of the food, as well as the uncomfortable feelings that came with consuming it. Purging myself of everything became my release. It became something so soothing, I found myself drinking loads of water just so I could make myself throw up and release those endorphins. It gave me a high, just like the lowering number on the scale did. I felt the best I ever had. I was losing weight fast, a pound a day. I had this incredible release for when I felt stressed or upset and I could still eat whatever I wanted and enjoy meals with my friends and family. Why didn't everyone do this? But eventually I started to lose my grip on my incredible secret. And in return, my secret had developed a grip on me. My secret started to hurt me. My teeth were becoming more sensitive. They hurt regularly and were no longer the gleaming white they'd once been. When our water got shut off, I was so desperate to purge that I snuck outside in the rain and threw up into bushes. I even choked on the toothbrush I'd been using to purge and truly thought that I was going to die like that. I reached my hand into my throat, grasping with my fingers to get a hold of this thin plastic toothbrush to pull it out. Crying and gasping for what felt like forever, my heart racing faster than it ever had, I pulled it out, wet with my saliva and vomit. And after taking a moment to catch my breath, I resumed purging. Everything that I'd once believed about weight loss and this magical way I'd found to do so was unraveling and revealing itself to be my own personal purgatory rather than the personal paradise I thought I'd discovered. I was consumed with going through drive throughs in the middle of the night to get the food I couldn't resist and then purging in an empty 7-Eleven Big Gulp cup in the backseat of my car illuminated by the dim street lights as I hunched over my cup, desperately trying to, enter, to empty the contents of my stomach. Disappearing to bathrooms after every meal with my family and returning with bloodshot eyes and the scent of lavender hand soap I had lathered my hands and arms in to mask the sour smell of vomit that constantly followed me. I was 16 and working 50 hour weeks at a fast food restaurant and spending every dollar of my paycheck on food to binge and then purge on. Every waking moment was spent either eating, purging, or thinking about my next opportunity to eat and purge. I wrote in my diary through teary eyes every day asking why am I like this? So ashamed of what I become, I no longer felt that I had an eating disorder but that I was the eating disorder. I'd woken up to the reality of the torment I'd been consumed by, but felt powerless to pull myself out of it. My body was quickly deteriorating, and it was obvious to those around me. Someone had to intervene, and that someone was my mom. One afternoon, I was curled up on the couch, scrolling through my phone, and as I sat there, Distracted and exhausted, my mom and my brother grabbed me and lifted me off the couch. We're going to the hospital, my mom demanded. I immediately started begging them to let me go. Please, no, I cried out. I promise I'll eat. It's fine. I'm fine, I continued insisting desperately to no avail. Soon, I was being put into the backseat of the family car, my shoeless feet kicking desperately. I was so afraid of my identity being taken from me because at this point, it was the only identity I had, my disorder, my addiction. I walked through the emergency room with my head down, my bare feet against the cold linoleum and my mother holding my hand. I was led by a nurse to a scale where they weighed me. I watched as it settled on the number 77. I was 77 pounds and all I felt when I saw that number was shame because it was a pound higher than it was at home. I was told I was dangerously underweight and needed to be admitted. I didn't agree, but suddenly the control I blindly held onto for so many years was being taken from me. I was helpless and had no choice but to obey. 
The following month was saturated with sleepless nights and feeding tubes, but also with acceptance. I found support with the other teenagers in similar positions that I had my daily meals with. We would sit together around a dining table calling out, you got this, whenever one of us would struggle. The support was immense. My ability to succumb to my behaviors was no longer an option due to nurses disallowing the use of the bathroom for an hour after meals. After that hour, a nurse would stand in the corner of the bathroom and listen to me use the toilet, then examine the contents to make sure I hadn't purged. While having a nurse listen to me pee was mortifying for my teenage pride, it prevented me from purging. This helped me to accept the feeling of food in my stomach and ride the wave of discomfort that came with it. We also focused on family meals so that my family could learn how to support me as well. My mom and dad would bring in their lunch and eat with me while a therapist offered support and comfort. It was a learning process for all of us. My dad, who regularly engaged in different diets and had an inherently fat phobic attitude, had to learn to be more conscious of diet talk around his recovering daughter. He still struggles with this. <laughs> and for my mom, who struggled with an array of eating disorders for years and spent countless hours unfairly blaming herself for my issues, my mom eventually disclosed to me the story of her 16-year struggle with anorexia and bulimia. And while this shed light on a lot, it also provided me with the comfort of knowing my mom understood what I was going through. Today we're closer than ever. My mom is my biggest ally and to this day my biggest supporter in my eating disorder recovery. After weeks of treatment and everything it entailed, I was released from the hospital into an outpatient program. I continued to go to my outpatient program for three months followed by years of therapy an eating disorder is just that. It's a disorder. It isn't curable. It will always be there. What I learned with therapy is how to accept it and cope with it. I still struggle, but I've learned to recognize my disorder for what it is, and I'm stronger because of it. I'm so much more than my secret addiction that I once felt consumed by, and I'm so much more than a number on a scale. Scavenging for my belongings with a flashlight. Betrayed in disbelief in the middle of the night when I found the walls of my bedroom empty, void of all the artwork you tore down and discarded that took me so many years to build. I was confronted with an unwanted mosaic of cleaner, wider squares, an indication of things that once existed to give me respite from the horrors of adolescence. I sit here, surrounded by blank walls because of you. My eyes wander throughout this room, in convenience with dusty secondhand bookshelves and a particle board dresser you drag from the side of the dumpster as if Jehovah had left it there for you overnight. A treasure chest, just for you, to store all these watchtowers you attempted to force down my throat as you drag me door to door in a powder blue suit, too hot and stuffy to wear at four years old, in the white reflective heat of Jack Murphy Stadium among all of your peers. So I took my little pants off and may have embarrassed us both, but <laughs> praise Jesus, I was, I, this sweaty little pondasol of a boy, was happy. And you were much happier still when I stopped crying at eight years old, screaming, I don't want to go with you again to that congregation a convention of crane flower followers to watch the dramatization of Lot's wife looking back, crystallizing into a pillar of salt, the magic trick performed by the actors with a white linen sheet, blindfolding all of these witnesses. But the trouble is I was confused because Jehovah told you to tell me we do not believe in magic tricks. And here I was witnessing a woman disappearing, which is to say you have lost yourself in this crowd and won't ever let yourself look back. And I don't know what compelled me to say that. I didn't want to go. I just couldn't sit through hours in the heat with people I've never met, 
telling me the things that Jehovah doesn't want me to do. And I question you, how is it he can see me? And then you hiss with impatient tongue that the devil lives inside of me. And ever since then, I have always wondered how you could say something so terrifying to a little boy who once took solace inside of you, worried with sweat that this was true, kept licking my skin to see how salty I tasted, a little boy afraid of the ocean because that is where salt comes from. I wonder if this is where sinners go after they disintegrate, after they've been sculpted into pillars or statues or figures of the false idols you shall not worship. The scriptures state, if it isn't written here, you cannot gather to celebrate for Jehovah is the one true God. Your devotion must be exclusive and this is where we live, in a four bedroom house with a bellowing husband serving his sentence at a 7-Eleven. Your oldest daughter who kept slamming her door in your face. Another daughter too young to have a daughter of her own. A son who got his girlfriend pregnant under my bunk bed. And me wondering why this family that took so many years for you to build is slowly being sculpted into a rebellion against you, against attending what you believe. This tribe I see in pictures inside a dingy photo album, a book of shadows from before I was born. The family I thought I knew, posed smiling in front of a lit up tree or my brother on Santa's lap or these friends of yours crowding our living room. Open mouths, buffet style, smiles, laughter, no pamphlets but rather presents and presents exchanged. I squint and claw at this evidence. Some photos won't peel away, hopelessly stuck to the binder page. Some photos missing, cleaner, wider squares indicating things that once existed. It appears you've left a trail of salt behind you. And I am jealous. I am jealous of the life you led and all you held before I was expelled from your body. What made you follow this path of righteousness? Why do you forbid us to honor the day I was born? What moment triggered this ironclad chain? Is it me? Was it giving birth to me? Was I a mistake, an accident, a moment of his lust you had to see through until it ended, a passion you gave into and now you feel unclean? Do you feel dirty because of me? It ain't your gap from your previous son, the youngest, a baby oblivious of the teachings to come. Is this why you will never really see all of me when I'm talking to you? Only to realize much later, as we sit in dad's hospital room, this gap tooth smile, this extra 20 pounds, this skin I scratch, these features on my face, this yarn you taught me to crochet, this clean and bright song I sing, these things I inherited from you have always been here. They have always existed. Like the unresolved silence we're constantly drowning in an ocean that surrounds an island paradise. You keep preaching to us about this kingdom of elite, obedient observers who will not put their right hand over their heart, who meet in a windowless room, who put on their best tie or their longest skirt, who never get to talk about all the hurt you were going to inflict on me if I didn't dispose of my sister's Christmas tree when I was 11 years old filled with resentment as you accepted their gifts anyway, as I had to find the joy of unauthorized holidays at someone else's house. Take the time to carve a pumpkin, only to leave it at someone else's house. Lie underneath the glow of a real pine tree and smile in someone else's house. Make sure to hide the sweet tarts, the issues of men's fitness, the pictures I took at my first pride parade, all in someone else's house. Up the street, from home to home, from place to place, you know that thing we practiced when I was little to see if neighbors had found their way. And so I guess I have you to thank for that lesson, that it will always be up to me to find my own heaven, that it may take walking hundreds of loathsome miles before I find contentment with friends who will take me as I am, a chosen family that doesn't live here in this room stilted with its blankness, and a note you left on my desk in the summer of 2000 telling me I am not smarter than God. The Vampire Slayer and Miss Jackson are not idols to worship. This is bullshit! I think I screamed, his name in vain, loud enough for him to find me standing inside this dumpster of a life, crying because I am a teenage boy who owns nothing but the stuff. You can't stop yourself from touching every goddamn fucking thing that doesn't belong to you, you devil bitch!
And I was tempted to thrash your wares about until they shattered, stack a pile of all your watchtowers, your Sunday bests, your mother's sewing machine, your emerald dress, smack dab in the center of this hovel and strike a match and burn it to ashes, let you feel my pain as a furnace combusts in your jewelry box brain. And I hate that you've never said I'm sorry because you believe Jehovah approves of this betrayal content with your decision, even if it meant I wouldn't speak to you for a year. Me, your son, the one you gazed upon every day as I woke up and went to bed, as I woke up and went to school and gallivanted until 10 p.m. because I couldn't stand the sight of you, a looming figure prying into my drawers when I'm not looking, who leave her husband on his deathbed just because you're anti-blood transfusion, and there you go again, imparting your views onto someone who's just trying to live his life. Well, I'll tell you what, this life is mine, and what's mine is this childhood desk that faces a window overlooking a parking lot where my car is, where sometimes I sit sobbing into my quartz filled hands and I don't know why I was put on this earth. Will I ever be more than a servant to the roots I witnessed decaying before me? Who am I pleading to when I whisper, I'm tired of living here with these elders the rest of the tribe left behind? If there is a God, could it be that he is punishing us for wanting to run? My sister, always swollen and struggling. My sister, always the last to know. My brother, currently caged for defending himself. The broken old man who's like a siren at sunrise, who swallows me alive in my dreams. The orange flames that streaked across our backyard, burning bushes the morning before everyone's Thanksgiving. My mother, the one who witnesses found in a state of denial, sweeping away forsaken debris, even though the Red Cross told us to leave. What do I believe when I force the words, dear God, out of my exhausted mouth? If you want me to pray, whatever your name is, can you promise me a quiet place? Can you disarm these weapons, her judgmental missiles, her insensitive grenades? Can you let her walk across the bridge rather than use what you've taught as a barricade? Do you have the power to turn back time, superimpose my image into those pictures of those party people laughing so I can ask her what happened before I was carved into a black sheep that has to carry the weight of all these things before I was scared of the sea? Can you nestle me against her chest as I listen for her reassuring breath cradled together in a waterbed? Can I build my own watchtower without her knocking down my door? Can you let us find our own way? Is there a way to rip through these thrift store curtains, crash through the slatted glass? Tell that 17 year old to get the fuck out of there. He doesn't have to stand for that. Tell the little boy, the devil doesn't exist. And even if he did, you're stronger than him. Ride your bike to the beach. You don't have to be afraid. Get your feet wet. Jump right in. Swim. As a young adult sitting in a physiological psychology class, I reflected upon the definitions the professor scrawled on the board, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I raised my hand and asked, what do you get when you cross one of those with one of those? The professor looked befuddled. I asked because that's my mother. I pointed at the word schizophrenia and that my father, I pointed to the words bipolar disorder. I noticed the professor's eyebrows raise as she began to comprehend, or perhaps it was fear I saw. 
A few of my classmates turned to look at me. Oh my, the instructor gasped as she erased those terms, but I remained lost in haunting memory. My mother was an only child like me, and Elizabeth Taylor looked alike she was petite, five foot two, with high cheekbones, perfectly arched brows, and a flawless complexion. Despite her natural gifts, she applied makeup, pancake batter thick, and cemented her towering beehive hairdo in place before she ever ventured out of the house. She had a taste for fashion and a passion for Bloomingdale's, her favorite haunt, where she bought her clothes even when we were on food stamps. It was her remarkable loveliness that first caught the eye of my father, a brilliant and talented commercial artist who was born on Christmas Day. People claimed he looked like Richard Chamberlain. My parents made a handsome couple, and I understand they were very much in love once, but I didn't get to witness much of that. Soon after becoming parents, their relationship became stormy and ridden with insurmountable challenges, a cross between Wuthering Heights and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> Ironically, two of their favorite movies. <laughs> I'm told my mother was born a blue-eyed blonde, but I only knew her to have hazel eyes and jet black hair. The story is that the pigmentation of her hair and eyes changed over the course of one feverish weekend when she endured a wicked collection of childhood illnesses, including measles and strep. Family members speculated that that might have been the event that predisposed her to the mental illness that lurked behind her picture-perfect exterior. She had a complete nervous breakdown at 26, shortly after I was born. That's when she discovered all the tape recorders hidden in the walls and began suspecting complex conspiracies plotted against her. The diagnosis? Paranoid schizophrenia. My father and maternal grandmother ended up sharing the parenting responsibilities for me while my mother was institutionalized at the Creedmoor State Mental Hospital in New York, where she received electroshock therapy. 21 times. She refused to engage in any type of talk therapy, so she was prescribed multiple psychotropic medications, including Thorazine, and sent home. The day she returned, I watched my parents hugging and sobbing in the hallway. At only three years old, I could feel an intense electric connection between them, and I squeezed between their knees to be a part of it. By the time I was five, hope for my mother's full recovery waned, and my father's bipolar symptoms began to manifest. In one manic episode, he came to believe he was Jesus, since they shared a birthday. <laughs> and then he sank into a deep depression when he wasn't crucified before he turned 31. <laughs> Unable to cope and unhappy with the lithium his doctor prescribed, he chose to self-medicate, initially with ale and eventually with Gordon's gin. Then he signed up for some college writing classes to give voice to his pain. My mother was frequently the subject of those short stories, something that infuriated her. When he began submitting for publication, the possibility of exposure exacerbated her paranoia, and the rejection letters, every one of which he kept, plunged him deeper into depression. His therapist encouraged him to leave. And after several false starts, he managed to desert us when I was seven. He abandoned his job absconded with the family savings, and spent some time in Venezuela, either grieving or celebrating, I'm not quite sure. My mother and I were left without money or medical benefits. Fortunately, we lived in my grandparents' house, and they didn't evict us when my mother failed to pay the rent. 
But I was then a child being raised by an angry, mentally ill woman who lacked medical insurance to cover her prescriptions and who often took liberties with the quantity of medication she took or skipped. After school each day, I would dive under my bed to cuddle with the dust bunnies, eyes closed tight, arms over ears, sobbing and chanting, please stop, like a mantra. My mother's tirade involved circling my bed, ranting about my father, detailing her inventory of hostilities. I lacked the vocabulary to fully comprehend, but I got the gist. She also suffered from insomnia and spent the wee hours of the night chugging coffee and chain smoking. I would shudder in my bed, listening to the slow, repetitive clink, clink of her spoon in the coffee cup. Sometimes she would wake me during the night when she turned on the lights in my room and paced around my bed, carrying on a one-sided conversation. My father was often the subject of those wild midnight ramblings. I'd keep my eyes closed and try hard not to shiver so she'd think I was asleep. Sometimes she'd turn the temperature of my electric blanket up so high that I would wake up sweltering. In the morning, as I ate breakfast, I would stare in awe at the extensive numerical calculations and complex ink doodles on the yellow legal pad she kept next to her overflowing ashtray on the kitchen table. Midday naps made up for her late night activity, and she would demand I rest with her. Our attached bedrooms allowed her to be aware of my every move. I would lay there frozen and wide-eyed for an hour or more while she snored. When I began to suffer from night terrors, she insisted it was because I read too many creature feature and monster magazines, so she threw them out. Oddly, the night terrors didn't cease. One night, when I was about 15 and studying for an economics test in our living room, my mother marched in, stopped abruptly, and faced me. When I looked up, I could see that her eyes were black, the pupils fully dilated. Never a good sign. So I braced and calculated my escape route when the accusations and swinging began, I grabbed my mimeograph notes and took cover in the bathroom, hooking the little latch on the rickety door. I jumped into the cold, claw-footed bathtub and surveyed the red velvet wallpaper that surrounded me. I leaned back and stared at the red enamel ceiling while my mother spewed obscenities and pounded the door. Open the door! Open it now, you goddamn little bitch! I turned my gaze to the trembling hook that was bouncing in its little silver ring and wondered if it would hold up or if she might shake it loose. A few times she tugged so hard, I could see a sliver of separation between the door and the jam. I held my notes in my left hand. The nails of my right were dug into my palm so hard they left behind deep red crescents. I spent that night in the tub and snuck out in the morning when she finally went to bed. I failed the economics test that day. When I was 16, my clashes with my mother were erupting more violently. I had to escape. The only option I could come up with was to join some local teens on an abandoned property. But when I shared my plan with my father, he suggested an alternative, move in with him. I was surprised and hopeful, despite the fact that he lived in a rundown Manhattan hotel. My mother was furious, but I moved into his dingy, cockroach-infested 11th floor room despite her objections. It was as tiny as a dorm room, with one large, low window directly across from the door. We opened my rollaway cot in the space between the foot of his bed and a small dresser. I was grateful to be there, away from my mother's insanity. And as long as my father got home before 11 at night, 
He would seem sober as he nursed a couple of nightcaps before going to sleep. But if he stayed out longer, I was afraid. There was nowhere to hide. One night, my father and I were talking, me sitting cross-legged on my cot, he on the edge of his bed. I could tell he was manic and intoxicated. He turned his attention to my college plans. What exactly? do you think you're going to do with a degree in anthropology, Karen? I mean, how will you make money? I'm going to be an archaeologist, I asserted. You're stuck in the past, my father slurred with disgust, taking another swig of his gin and tonic and looking sideways at me. You can't hack the present, babe. So you're just going to hide in the past, digging up other people's bones. He proceeded to condemn my aspirations, painting a bleak picture of my future. Hearing my dreams eviscerated brought me to tears. He laughed at me. Then he placed his hand on my head. I am the Christ. I will heal you. Father in heaven. Heal Karen through my hands. Help her let go of the past and embrace the future. She is just a little girl, a very angry and frightened one. Help her see that she doesn't have to hide. Heal her. I pulled away while he was basking in that moment of grace, but before I knew what was happening, I felt his hands around my neck. I'm going to put you out of your misery, he growled. Somehow I got to my feet and we struggled. Then I found myself hanging out the 11-story window, the small of my back on the low windowsill, his hand still around my throat. Still in shock, I gasped for air while looking up at the New York City sky, light swirling above me as I flailed and punched, trying not to fall. With a surge of adrenaline, I was finally able to push him off and backwards onto his bed, only because he was sufficiently inebriated. And I darted out into the hallway, shoeless, wandering the stairwell for hours in my rainbow toe socks. Later, after he finally passed out, I went back in, curled up on my cot for a restless sleep no idea of where else I might go. My father vanished without warning for a few months right after I graduated high school. Working for minimum wage at a restaurant, I panicked every time the manager inquired about the rent. Fortunately, I had one free meal a day at work. The day I left for college, my boyfriend came to pick me up. We were almost finished packing his car with my things when my father appeared, walking down the street toward us, a scowl on his face. He wanted to talk, but I was agitated and anxious to flee. He hurled a barrage of curses at me, and I jumped into the passenger seat. Go, I yelped, and we sped away. I leaned back. closed my eyes, hands clenched and nails digging into my palms. I took a long, deep breath as my father's voice grew more and more distant, eventually drowned out by the sounds of traffic. I wake up as I normally do. I lay in bed trying to fully wake up. 
I attempt to get my eyes to adjust to the light of the warm spring sun glaring in through the blinds. As I lay there, I feel a gut feeling. Not just any gut feeling. This one feels odd. It feels as if my intestines are being twisted. I try to shake it off and I reach for my phone to distract myself when I notice a text message from my cousin Edith. Hey prima, can you please give me a call when you get a chance? I don't know if you heard, but your dad is in the hospital. I'm on my way over there, but my nana told me to contact you. I read the message, but didn't think much of it. I don't even know what to say to her. I go back and forth in my head thinking of my response before I reply. Growing up, I didn't have a relationship with my father since he left us when I was young. I was raised by my single mother and older siblings. My father never attempted being in my life, so I boxed him up and placed him in the smallest crevice of the back of my brain. Even the few times he would come around, it felt awkward. My father was a stranger to me. How do you react to the news that someone you barely know is in the hospital? Thank you for letting me know. I'll head over soon. I decided to reach out to my brother, Edgar. He's the only one out of my siblings who still stays in contact with my father. Good morning, boo-boo. Do you know what's up with that, I asked. Yeah, my nana called me, he replied. Well, what happened? He shot himself. I paused mid-text. My mind boggled as I tried to wrap my head around what my brother just told me. So the news gets worse, I thought to myself. At 20 years old, I can't even recall the last time my father and I had a conversation. Now I didn't know how to feel. I feel my anxiety start to creep up. I don't think much about it anymore, and I head over to the hospital. I arrived at the hospital. I look up and see the large metal letters that spell out UC San Diego Health Center. I enter through the double sliding doors that lead me into the front lobby. I feel a huge lump in my throat, and as much as I try, I keep swallowing, the feeling doesn't go away. The ambiance was unfamiliar to me. The blasting AC in the hospital brings chills up my spine. Besides the fact that my head was not mentally with me, I had no idea what I was doing here. I approach the receptionist and give her my father's name. She gives me the floor number he is on and I head over. I enter the waiting room with about eight people. I shyly wave my hand signaling hello to the people there. I walked over to my cousin Edith who was sitting next to my nana in the beige semi-torn leather benches that they have in the seating area. There were unfamiliar faces and I think that's what made it more awkward aside from the obvious elephant in the room. I quietly sat next to her and asked her about what happened. The dead silence said it all. She signaled me towards the entrance by the elevators. She looked at me with pain in her dark brown eyes. I knew what she was about to tell me was not good. Do you know what happened? She whispered. Yeah, Edgar told me my dad shot himself, but that's about it, I uttered. I don't even know how to tell you, Prima, but your dad shot himself in the face and he's in surgery right now. I felt my knees weaken, the same way they weaken after you squat a hundred times. This was not the news I expected. My brain shut everything around me out and all I felt was a, ru a rush of warm tears run down my face. I was shocked, the tears tore down my pride. I wasn't prepared for the details, but I wasn't prepared for my reaction either. But how? What happened? I sobbed. No one knows what happened or why, she explained. They just heard the shot fire and found him in his room like that. I stood in disbelief. I couldn't piece my words together. I kept wondering why he did or if he even did it himself. I couldn't even imagine how to feel finding him in the room. Many thoughts raced through my mind. I wasn't even there to witness the incident, but my mind painted thousands of scenarios in my head, and it wasn't a pretty sight. My father had shot himself in the face and it blew off part of his nose, some of his eye, and had some slight damage to his brain. He had been in reconstructive surgery for hours, but the hours passed by slowly. I felt like I was tracking time with an hourglass, the grains of sand slowly piling on one another. After eight long hours and many skim grafts later, the surgeons were able to do their best and reconstruct most of his face. Unfortunately, he was in a coma. We were advised that we were allowed to visit him in his room. Although he wasn't responsive, we were able to keep him company. My stomach churned and twisted into a million knots as I walked into the room, his room. Father-daughter dynamics are complicated. Even in a functional family, I haven't seen him in a few years. Seeing him now was uncomfortable, like really uncomfortable. But there, was, there he was, my father was just laying there all bandaged up like a mummy. I couldn't cry anymore. It was like there was nothing left. I felt empty. That's when my father's girlfriend, Rocio, walked in. I met her once in my life about a decade ago on my first communion, but I wonder, who, I wonder now who needs God more. We stood there in silence like we were both at a confession. Como has estado? She broke the silence first and asked how I am. 
Bien, ¿y usted? I bluntly replied as if it was the perfect time to ask me how I am. ¿Miraste tu foto? ¿Cuál foto? I didn't know if I was clueless or if I cared. On the left side of the room, sitting on the windowsill, was a baby photo of myself in a frame. I was about three or four years old, sitting in a small, white, barnhouse-style rocking chair while I, was sat, while I sat in my gap denim overalls and my curly blonde hair styled into some pigtails. Esa foto no la encontramos encima de la cómoda cuando encontramos a tu papá. She explained to me on how that photo was in the room when the incident happened. I looked at the photo myself again. I sat there in a rocking chair, smiling ear to ear, innocent at such an age. At that age, I didn't even remember my father. I looked happy and had no worries in the world. I forgot him, but he never forgot me. How could he live with himself knowing that his daughter didn't have him to depend on? But I was too young to even reciprocate his, my father's absence. I wonder what he was thinking when he did it. The photo, in the, room during the, in the photo was in the room during the incident. It was left on top of the dresser. I kept thinking about whether my, or not my father did it on purpose. Was he regretting his life? Was he drunk? Or was the incident staged to be something that it wasn't? My father remained in a coma for about four days. I visited him every day. I wanted to make sure he was okay. He woke up, but he wasn't able to speak and remembered nothing about his incident. Although he probably didn't recognize me, I wanted him to know I was there for him. Despite the lack of communication that there was due to him not being able to talk, I fixed that by bringing him a whiteboard and markers to communicate. I felt like my visits would build some sort of bond. The tables had turned now. I was taking care of him instead of him taking care of me. Weeks passed by and he remained in the hospital. I continued my hospital visit routine, so much that I was promoted to one of my father's emergency contacts. My father and I started building some kind of relationship. On his bad days, I was the one to calm him down. I always assured him that he will be okay and he'd get to go home soon. On his good days, we would talk to the best of his ability and I would catch him up on, on what was going on outside of the cold white hospital walls. Not the father and daughter bond wasn't daddy's girls just yet. Let's not jump ahead of ourselves now. He was starting to talk more. We communicated better. It felt good to be able to be around him after years of, not, of him not being there for me. I remember a month and a half into the hospital ICU visiting routine. I was walking down the hospital hallways. I noticed the white vinyl tile, the bright white hospital lights spotlighting me as I walked past other rooms before I reached my father. When I arrived at his room, I was asked to step out while they cleaned him up. I waited in the lobby. I patiently waited there, seated next to the fish tank. I watched the fish swim gracefully in the, s in the green kelpy water. In the periphery, I see a small group approaching. I noticed it was my father's girlfriend and her two daughters. My father has always been around them, and I don't know how to feel about it too much. I didn't normally bump into them at the hospital, and I preferred it that way. I waved at them as they sat down next to me. Where's your dad? One of her daughters asked. They're cleaning him up, I replied. Soon after, the nurse walks along with my father. In the nurse's hand, I see a deck of cards. We greeted my father as he slowly sat down on a chair. I see the joy in his eyes when he sat down. I've never seen him get that happy when I come alone. One daughter suggested blackjack, so they taught me how to play. I noticed how well they get along. They laughed and cracked jokes with one another. I even hear them call each other by their nicknames. Good job, sunshine, one daughter said. You're cheating, the other accused. I start feeling out of place, as if, as if I am that extra puzzle piece that you can't seem to find a spot for. Each word that they, the daughter spoke to my father felt like having alcohol poured onto an open wound. The wounds that I had that I wasn't aware of. The fact that I never had this enjoyment with my father made me feel some type of way. The relationship they have built with each other is nowhere near the relationship I had with my father. And it hurt. I felt a knot in my throat and my eyes burned. I tried to choke back the feeling. It felt as if they rubbed it in my face, but maybe I took it the wrong way. I tried to act cool, but deep inside I was ready to hide. I felt like a turtle trying to hide in its shell to protect itself from harm. I built up the courage to say my goodbyes. I left with, without any hesitations. From going to the hospital every single day, I started going once, a, once every other week. I started gaining my distance until I stopped going completely. I kept ask, being asked by my family why I stopped going, but I was far too embarrassed to admit why. Whenever my mom or my siblings would ask me how my father was doing, I would ignore the subject. Ana, ¿por qué ya no visitas a tu papá? Ana, how's your dad? Is his face messed up? That's a question that I don't quite have an answer to. Being constantly asked felt like a broken record. I tried to tuck my father back into the small crevice in my brain and forget about him. 
I felt stupid going to the hospital every single day like I used to go. I wasted my time trying to build a relationship with someone who didn't put the effort back. I didn't expect this to hurt me as much as it did, but I realized, I realized something important from all of this. I have a relationship with my loved ones who have been in my life for the past 22 years. My, brother, my mother, brother, sister, and my boyfriend. People who don't think twice about being in my life. And because of them, I am who I am. We hold unbreakable bonds that are irreplaceable. This past semester, I took a position at an organization from San Diego working with immigrants, mostly refugees, helping them with the process of becoming U.S. citizens. It occurred to me that throughout my entire life as an adult, I have been working with people in need, especially young people from the city where I grew up, Cavadarsi, Macedonia. The nonprofit I ran provided them with life experiences such as travel, meeting foreign people, exposure to different cultures, and a variety of educational after-school programs. I was, and still am, all about social inclusion and advocacy. Now, as I'm again working with people in need of aid, I'm reflecting on my past, and I think I have found out why I'm person I am today. Perhaps the key moment in my development as a person was meeting a Bosnian refugee when we were both kids. It was 19... 92. It happened while I was at school. It was a cool autumn day. I was a child in the early 1990s. The weather was typical for that time of year in Macedonia when I met Leila for the first time. A short blonde girl with super red cheeks and small blue eyes that would not look straight up at you. Her dress was kind of weird. It didn't look um, at all similar to any of the dresses I had seen some of my friends wearing. Maybe it's some new fashion, I thought, but I could tell that the dress was pretty old. However, she was dressed the way she was, and she had her fingers intertwined, pulling one finger, then another. Her, uh, her golden hair seemed out of shape, a bit tangled. As we sat at our desks, someone from the class immediately started laughing at her for no reason, at least for nothing that I would mock someone for. Our English teacher, uh, who had uh, brought Leila to the class, asked them to stop, but no one listened to her. She informed us that Leila is our new student. It was sad to see so many unfriendly faces, staring at the poor girl, and it felt even sadder when I saw her scared face against the face of the laughing dumb kids. I couldn't ignore the scene. I raised my voice against the laughter and I grabbed a third chair and put it next to me and my friend and I offered Layla to sit with us. That was the first time Layla lifted her head and looked at uh, me with a smile that no one else noticed. She was happy that someone defended her. Hvala puno. Thanks a lot, she said to me in a language other than Macedonian. I could, I could understand her because my father had some friends who were merchants from Serbia and spoke the language. After that, I shared my books with her. She didn't have books yet. She didn't even speak Macedonian, much less know how to read and write it. I told my parents about my new friend, Leila, after going to her home and seeing how she lived in a dormitory. Her family was placed uh, there and they had almost nothing. They couldn't bring their possessions while trying to flee a war, but they had a variety of canned food. I had never met refugees before. Nearly a week later, my mom asked me to invite Leila and her family for dinner, and they were happy to visit us. As soon as our guests left our house with a huge bag of food and clothes that my mother had placed earlier in, a, in, the, in, earlier in the day, I disappeared into my room. What just happened? I thought. I imagined what Layla went through. The horrific memories her mother spoke about were stuck in my head. My heart began to beat faster and faster. Alone in my room, staring at the candle, I could almost hear the bombs falling around the bus in which Layla traveled with her mother, brother, 
and fellow refugees escaping the siege of Sarajevo. How is this even possible? I thought, and I couldn't find a response, nor could Leila tell me. I was sure. She was still like a scared rabbit in the middle of a road, frozen. In this candlelight, I imagined the screaming faces, the bus driving as fast as the driver can, trying to avoid falling bombs, dead people around, shattered glass, crying faces, burnt houses. Bilo je užasno, pakleno. It was awful, hellish, Leila's mother said and burst into tears in my mother's arms after sharing their, sharing their story that evening. My mom cried together with, the, with this sweet, tiny woman, Emina. My grandparents were in the room as well, and my grandmother was caressing the head of Leila's little brother, Asmir, while tears were rolling down her face. My father tried to hide his tears, but he gave up. My older brother had given up a while ago. He couldn't listen, so he left the room. And my grandfather, the oldest in the family, just pressed his eyes with his thick old hands. Leila had, uh, had her tearful eyes focused on her mommy, but she didn't cry. It seemed as if she cried out all her tears. What about your husband? My father asked. We don't know anything about him, responded Emina through unstoppable tears. And that was the moment when Leila let her own tears flow. Leila's father stayed to fight in the war. No one knew if he was alive or dead. This was the first time I heard about the war from someone in it. And the story stuck with me. I was listening, observing everyone's movements imagining and sweating while the rest were peacefully crying. To me, it was like a scene from a movie. But I wasn't stupid. This wasn't a movie. It was real. Lila and her family were Bosnian refugees. Like the people I saw on TV, climbing off the trucks and buses, while other people lend their hands to help them get off the vehicles. In 1991, I noticed my family stocking extra items in the basement. They were buying more flour, canned food and grain than usual. I lived in Macedonia, the only former Yugoslav Republic to gain sovereignty without resistance from the Yugoslav army. Although the war wasn't affecting us directly, I could feel the secondary effects of the other countries falling apart around us. The breakup of Yugoslavia. The beautiful country on the Balkan Peninsula where everyone lived in brotherhood and unity, was underway. The first victim was a young soldier from my city. He was killed in Croatia. His funeral was public and very big, with streets full of people, crying and damning the war. But I never felt that this war was so close to home, as I did when I heard Leila's family story. I was very scared. What if during the night bombs woke me up? My parents spoke to me and my brother that night. They assured us that nothing bad would happen and that we are safe. But I was not convinced. Probably Leila and her brother were told the same. I felt my body tremble and shiver. I was thinking, if those silly kids at school laugh again on Monday, I swore I would slap their faces. I tried to sleep to forget about the story. I wish that Leila didn't even exist. Hopefully, it was only a bad dream, but it wasn't. Meeting Leila and her family affected me as a person. I grew up much faster than I should have. Eventually, Leila and her family relocated from Macedonia to Spain. It was a sad day for us to separate, but it was for their own good. After they moved to Spain, we wrote letters for a while. At some point, we lost contact and I wondered for years and years how to find them again. As time passed by, the internet advanced and I started entering random online chat rooms to connect with Bosnian refugees to try to reconnect with my friend. There were platforms uh, dedicated to Bosnian refugees from all over the world who were trying to find their friends and family after the war. It was unsuccessful. One day, I decided to contact random people from the city that she lived in with the hope that she had not moved. And I hit the jackpot. 
It was the biggest coincidence in my life. The first person I wrote to replied in under an hour. The person responded. Dear Alexandra, if Asmir is her brother and Emina her mother, then the person you're looking for is my best friend. I jumped with joy and I couldn't believe that I had found my friend. I was talking with Leila and her mom within an hour after this random person connected us. It was a miracle. We were crying and smiling. I learned that the father was alive. After he survived the war, he found his family in Spain and reunited with them. They created a new life, a scarred life, but still a life. Today we are Facebook friends and I see Leila's life through the photos since we have never seen each other in person as adults. She seems happy. She is always smiling. She went back to Bosnia only once, when she was 18 years old, and never again. I believe it was too painful. She was robbed of her life there. The memories of Leila have haunted me all of my life. My friend lost her childhood. Her family lost most of their extended relatives. But the experience I had with her shaped me into the person I am today. It was tough to hear the story at the time and to live with fear of war. Now when I think about, about it and look at the faces of the refugees I work with, I see her face. It could have been me. It's interesting how people affect and shape us without knowing. Maybe I'll show her this so she can finally know how that small blonde girl changed my life when I was just a child. Alright, let's hear from our performers tonight. All right, thank you all for coming out and thank you all for sharing your stories. Uh, real quick before we wrap up, I just do want to mention that So So We All has a few other events for the month of May. Uh, so the horror radio show Listen With The Lights Off has its new episode 6 coming out this Friday. Uh, our unscripted open mic show, Long Story Short, is Thursday, May 6th uh, with the theme of Nature Calls. So whatever that puts in mind. Uh, our Mesa College Vamp Show is on Friday, May 7th, and if you'd like to submit for May's Vamp Show uh, with the theme of Bamboozled, please do so by May 2nd. Uh, real quick, let's bring up all the performers again one more time. Give them a hand. Like, thank you all again. Like, please, come on up. Come on up. Thank you guys so much for making this show happen. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to all the performance and writing mentors. So Elaine Gingery, Dallas McLaughlin, Kelly Bowen, David Latham, Francisco Martinez Cuello, Luis Julig, Kim Pappas, and Victoria Leva were also contributed to making this show happen tonight. So, one more time, thanks again to the Whistle Stop Bar for having us. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good.